Right, this is now uh, the time to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, my very great pleasure uh, to um, introduce uh, Oscar van der Williams. I should not really need a, a piece of paper um, because he has been my um, student. Uh, Oscar uh, studied uh, mathematics in Oxford uh, and versus the uh, MA uh, 2006, and maths, I should say, and then his um, a doctorate in uh, 2009. Uh, he uh, went then off to a postdoc in Copenhagen, and uh, after two years came uh, back to England, uh, to Cambridge, on a Hirsch Smith uh, Fellowship. Uh, then he uh, received a lectureship, a reader, professor, and moved up the ladder. And indeed, from the 1st of uh, January, he will be the Sutlerian uh, Professor of Pure Mathematics. This is a chair that has previously been um, occupied by Cayley, Hardy, and Mordell, and others, of course. Let me just say a, a word uh, about his um, work. Uh, in joint work with Soren Galassius, he studied modelized spaces of higher dimensional manifolds, leading to a sequence of papers about which Soren talked uh, at the ICM in 2014, and for which they both received together the 2022 Clay Research Award. Also in 2022, Oscar gave uh, his own ICM talk on a topic closely related uh, to today's talk, I believe. Um, he, his work with Soren and subsequently with Manuel Kranich and uh, Alexander Kupis, um, students of um, and postdocs of uh, both of them, has brought a renaissance of what I would call the algebraic topology of manifolds. They have been able to make astonishing progress on problems that have been dormant and abandoned by the masters, I think. Um, this goes back to Tom, Milner, Smale, Sullivan, Waldhausen in the 60s and 70s. And I think uh, partially because manifolds are fickle and uh, people have looked at them, at stabilizing them, making them even uh, more flabby in a sense. Uh, and there are two different ways to do it. And I think uh, one way was studied before, especially with Waldhausen's work. And uh, I think Oscar and uh, Soren managed to find a way uh, that keeps the dimension fixed. But maybe we hear more about that. So not surprisingly, uh, that in addition to the Clay Award, uh, Oscar received many more distinctions and prizes in 2017, a Whitehead Prize from the LMS, a Philip Leverholm Prize in 2018, an ERC starting grant in 2019, the Danny Heinemann Prize uh, of the Göttingen uh, Academy of Science and Humanities, and the Ober Wolfach Prize. Until recently, he was one of two managing editors of the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society, uh, and uh, since 2016, he has been an editor of uh, another LMS journal, namely the uh, Journal of Topology, and he's now a member of the LMS Publications Committee. As I said, I'm very pleased that uh, Oscar accepted our invitation to give this first lecture, and if he hadn't won so many prizes, I wouldn't have taken so much time of his talk. So anyway, uh, Oscar. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, embarrassing introduction. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, I want to tell you a, a little bit about some developments that have happened in the last few years uh, around uh, symmetries of manifolds. Uh, and what I want to tell you about are symmetries of very simple manifolds. So I'm only going to talk about these, these three kinds of manifolds. So Euclidean space, which I hope I don't have to define. Uh, so the, the unit disk, so D to the N, so that's the N-dimensional unit disk in Euclidean space. Uh, and Sn, so the n-dimensional sphere inside n plus one dimensional Euclidean space, or in other words, the boundary of the n plus one dimensional disk. So these are the manifolds I want to talk about, uh, uh, but I want to talk about their symmetries. So a, a symmetry means an identification of such manifold with itself. So it's a function from the manifold to itself, which is invertible, uh, and, uh, but you can ask for the function to have various levels of quality. 
If you're just doing plain topology, maybe you just ask for the function to be continuous and maybe it's inverse to be continuous as well. So that's a, a homeomorphism. So that would be looking at self homeomorphisms of, of such a manifold. Uh, it turns out that's quite difficult as we'll discuss. Uh, maybe more familiar is to talk about smooth symmetries of a manifold. So functions which are differentiable and their inverse is also differentiable. And maybe we say infinitely differentiable. It turns out not to make so much of a difference, but let's just say it's infinitely differentiable. Uh, so because, it's, because they're invertible functions from a manifold to itself, you can compose them with each other. Uh, so there are topological groups of symmetries of a given manifold. So either the group of all self homeomorphisms of the manifold M or the group of all self diffeomorphisms of the manifold M. Uh, and I, I realized I didn't say anything about this in the slide, but uh, so that there's certainly groups of symmetries, but I want to think about the groups as being topological spaces themselves. We certainly know what we mean. If, if, I, if, I, have, if I give you two functions from M to M and it, one sends the point to X and one sends it to X prime, which is very near to X, then probably those functions should be considered to be very near to each other. And in the smooth case, you should ask for the functions to be near, but maybe also their derivatives should be close to each other and their higher derivatives should be close to each other and so on. That's a standard way of doing this. Uh, so I consider these as topological groups and I'm interested in the shape of, the, of this space, homeo M or diff M. So you think about it as a space in its own right, even though it is the symmetries of some other much easier space. Uh, there's one little uh, caveat that I'll mention. Um, in the case of the disk, so the disk is strictly speaking a manifold with boundary. Right? Points on the boundary of the disk are a little different to points on the interior. Uh, when I think about symmetries of such a thing, I always want the symmetry to be the identity near the boundary. Okay? So they only move stuff in the middle. So symmetry is, so, so that's maybe the least familiar of these kind of ideas, I think. The fact that we want to think about symmetries that leave some part fixed. So the way you should think about such a thing, so here's a, a symmetry of the disk. That if I just drew it all white, you wouldn't be able to see it. So I've imposed a famous logo uh, so that you can see what, uh, what is being done. So near the boundary, nothing's moving. And I've just put my hand in the middle and twisted around the middle a little bit, okay? That's a map from the disk to itself that, doesn't, that leaves points near the boundary where they were. So this is not a very interesting symmetry because I just explained to you how to make it, right? You put your hand in the middle or you put your stick in the bucket of paint and you swirl it around a bit. But more or less by definition, you can just swirl it back the other way and everything will go back to where it started. So in fact, there's a deformation from this symmetry to the identity just by turning less and less and less. So, okay, it's, it's not the identity, but it's also not super exciting. <clears throat> so I want to do two warm-ups to thinking about symmetries of manifolds. Uh, and the first one is just Euclidean space when we think about smooth symmetries of it, okay? And of course, there's lots of smooth symmetries of Euclidean space. The space of it is, uh, the space of such things is enormous. Uh, but, uh, so I'm an algebraic topologist, so we don't really consider spaces as spaces. We consider spaces up to the equivalence of co collapsing and expanding and deforming them and so on. So if you allow yourself to deform this space, it turns out it's not so very complicated. Uh, and this is a theorem basically due to Newton, uh, because well, if I have a diffeomorphism, F from RD to RD, I can just write down this formula, which I'll give you a moment to pass, okay? I, I take a parameter T between zero and one, and I write down this little formula, okay? And if T is, I think, one, this is uh, just F of X again, and if t is uh, not zero, then it's just some other smooth function. And as t goes to zero, of course, this converges because that's the definition of what it means to be differentiable, right? It converges to the derivative of the function itself, which is a linear map. And so this is just a, a completely simple process that starts with any smooth, any diffeomorphism and does something and it converges to a diffeomorphism that happens to be a linear map. So it's collapsing the whole complicated space of all smooth symmetries of Euclidean space to the group of D by D invertible matrices. In other words, the group of, I mean, linear maps. In particular, that's a finite dimensional space, even though the original space of all smooth symmetries was some horrific infinite dimensional complicated thing. You can do it a little better because the Gram-Schmidt process that one learns in linear algebra tells you how to take any matrix and convert it into an orthogonal matrix. Right. It takes any basis and converts it into an orthonormal basis. 
and that deforms the, the group of all D by D matrices to the group of orthogonal D by D matrices, which is a compact group. It's even better than being finite dimensional. It's actually compact. <clears throat> um, and uh, compact groups are very well studied. Um, it's, uh, you can study the orthogonal group using the fact that the quotient of one orthogonal group by the previous one is a sphere. And we know how to think about the topology of a sphere and you can do an induction and you can understand more or less anything you like about the orthogonal groups this way. So even though we started with a huge infinite dimensional space or group of symmetries, up to homotopy, up to deformation, it's equivalent to this small compact group that we can understand quite systematically. So roughly speaking, any kind of topological question or algebraic topological question you might have about this space, one can sort of answer by doing this and then doing classical topology with spheres and things like that. So that's one uh, warm up. Uh, and this involves, let me just go back <clears throat> to my formula. This involves a taking a kind of scaling limit of the original diffeomorphism, right? We sort of scale it outwards by a factor of t. And then any smooth function becomes closer and closer to a linear function. So there's another case that turns out to be quite easy. And that's if you think about homeomorphisms of the disk. So continuous symmetries now, not smooth ones, of the disk. And remember, when I say of the disk, I mean fixing the boundary always. So here there's another kind of deformation you can do. Instead of scaling outwards, you can scale inwards. If I have a homeomorphism, this is a bit less familiar maybe. If I have a homeomorphism of the disk, F, say, I can make a new one, Ft, by doing my homeomorphism in the middle in a ball of radius t, and then doing the identity on an annulus of radius 1 minus t. So when t is 1, I think, this is just the function f. And as I shrink it, I mean, it becomes the identity on a bigger and bigger annulus, and it does the interesting stuff on a smaller and smaller disk. And uh, slightly outrageously, this just converges to the identity function. Okay, if you're used to thinking about differentiability, of course, you think this is a horrific thing to do, as indeed it is, because if f happened to be differentiable, this is differentiable for every value of t, but the derivatives in no way converge, right? The derivative in the origin is going to go crazy in some way. But if we're just doing homeomorphisms, we don't even have derivatives, and so we can't worry about whether they converge or not. We're just talking about continuous functions. So this is a perfectly legal deformation from any homeomorphism you give me of the disk to the identity. And it just shrinks the support, and then at time zero, it just vanishes. Um, so what this proves is that the group of homeomorphisms of the disk is actually just contractible. It's equivalent to a point in a completely canonical way by this formula. So that's, uh, okay, so that's maybe not an exciting answer, but it, it's a complete answer. Um, <clears throat> so, so those are two uh, easy cases. So smooth symmetries of Euclidean space is somehow known. And continuous symmetries of a disk is also known and trivial. Uh, so the other cases are, I haven't talked about symmetries of spheres at all yet. And I haven't talked about continuous symmetries of Euclidean space. And I haven't talked about smooth symmetries of the disk. Those are the sort of, there's six kind of examples. These are two of them. So I, I now want to just talk about the sphere uh, very briefly. <clears throat> Uh, for the sphere, it turns out you can reduce everything about spheres to things about disks or Euclidean space as follows. So if you study homeomorphisms of the sphere, pick, pick some point on the sphere. I've taken the D plus first unit vector, for example, uh, and look at the function that takes the homeomorphism and evaluates it at the D plus first vector. Uh, you can check that that's a bundle, as we call it, meaning it's like uh, it's, all the fibers look the same of that map. And the fiber over ED plus one is homeomorphisms of the sphere that fix one vector, that fix one point. But given the homeomorphism of the sphere that fixes one point, I mean, you may as well remove the point and say, I'm just giving you a homeomorphism of the rest. And the rest is just a Euclidean space. So actually the fiber is just the group of homeomorphisms of Euclidean space, which is not one of the ones we did in the two warm-up cases, it's another one. But my point is that we've reduced understanding the sphere to understanding Euclidean space and some question about if you understand two things in a sequence, can you understand the third? Um, in the case of smooth symmetries, you do a similar trick. In that case, it turns out you shouldn't just evaluate one vector. You should evaluate what happens at one vector and all its derivatives. And its derivative, sorry, at that point. So if you do that and you grant me a little bit of artistic license, 
that gives you a map from diffeomorphisms to the D plus first orthogonal group by remembering where the vector goes and where the derivatives of all the other vectors at that point go. And that has a similar property. It's something like a bundle, and its fiber is the group of diffeomorphisms of the disk, smooth symmetries of the disk fixing the boundary, which again is not an answer because we don't know what that is, but we've reduced questions about the sphere to questions about the disk by this ruse. <clears throat> So, uh, so there's now, we've dealt sort of with four cases. And the two ones, we, we've reduced things to understanding homeomorphisms of Euclidean space and diffeomorphisms of the disk. Those are the, those are the sort of two unknowns, if you think about these as being some kind of equations for, for these various spaces. Uh, and the final ingredient is that those two things are roughly equivalent to each other. So this is, everything I've said so far is more or less trivial. This is a very non-trivial theorem due to Mollet, which is that the space of diffeomorphisms of the disk is if you don't know what these terms mean, you shouldn't worry so much about them, but it's some function of the space of homeomorphisms of Euclidean space. And let me just promise you that these, these constructions here, like dividing out by OD and taking based maps from a D plus one sphere, these are bread and butter things to do in algebraic topology. So basically that's saying, understanding diffeomorphisms of the D-disk is equidifficult to understanding homeomorphisms of Euclidean space. So, this is not, so we don't know what either of them are, but we know they somehow contain the same sort of information. So of these six things that we talked about, two of them were quite easy. Another two of them were equivalent to the other two, and the other two one of, are equivalent to each other. So that we've really reduced understanding all these kind of symmetry groups to understanding either of these two. It doesn't really matter which. Um, right, so that's what I said. Uh, okay, so uh, let me tell you uh, what we know about these things. So in the dimensions that humans can think about, uh, they're all trivial. The groups of diffeomorphisms of the disk in all dimensions that humans can visualize are just trivial. And so it's very against that intuition that this might stop being true. Okay, so the, the group of diffeomorphisms being contractible is equivalent by this, these sort of tricks I said on the previous slide to various other statements. It's the same as saying, Every homeomorphism can be canonically improved to a linear homeomorphism. It's also the same as saying any homeomorphism of the sphere can be canonically made smooth and can be canonically be made an isometry. So all these things are equivalent to saying diffeomorphisms of the disk are contractible. In other words, they're saying in these dimensions, the only symmetries that there are come from rigid symmetries. They come from isometries of the manifolds involved. That's what they're saying. And in dimensions one, two, three, where we draw pictures and so on, we're kind of used to thinking this way. Uh, but it turns out this is never true ever again. In every dimension that we can't visualize, it's not true. Every dimension that we can't visualize. Uh, so that is the consequence, I mean, of the work of a tremendous many people. I mean, if you, Milner proved that there's an exotic sphere in the 50s, there's an exotic seven sphere which turns out to be in exactly the same statement as that there's a diffeomorphism of the six disk that cannot be made rigid. And so one case was already due to Milner and there's many sort of in between cases, but we now know in every dimension D at least four. So the work of Watanabe is the, the case D equals four, which is famously difficult in, in a differential topology. <clears throat> um, but uh, so we now know that yes, this is never true ever again. So in every other dimension, it's not true that every smooth symmetry can be made continue, that every continuous symmetry can be made smooth at the sphere. It's not true that they can be all be made by symmetries. Uh, all, all of these equalities are non-equalities in every other dimension. So if it's not contractible, then you can say, well, what, what is it? If it it's, it's not equivalent to a point, so is it equivalent to something else that we know? Uh, and that's sort of what I want to try to explain. <clears throat> Uh, but before one does that, you should uh, humble yourself a little bit, because the following is a very, very difficult question in, in dimensions not one, two, and three. How many path components does the space of homeomorphisms of Euclidean space have? So let me break it down a little bit. So there's one, one thing we can do. If you have a homeomorphism of Euclidean space, you can check whether it reverses orientation or not. Okay, if it's differentiable, you can check that easily by differentiating anywhere. But even if it's only continuous, you can do it in a, using some algebraic topology. So you look at the map on cohomology and you take this determinant. That gives you a map to plus or minus one, and any reflection goes to minus one. So there's at least two path components. There's the orientation preserving ones, and there's the orientation reversing ones. 
<clears throat> so you can refine the question a little bit to say, is it true that every orientation preserving homeomorphism of Euclidean space can just be deformed to the identity? So in dimensions one, two, and three, that's true. If we say if we say for smooth, if we say for diffeomorphisms, it's obviously true because you can pick a point, differentiate it, and then it either is a reflection or it's a rotation, and so you can deform the identity. If you have a homeomorphism which is differentiable at any point, it's obviously true because you can take the scaling limit at that point and it converges to a linear map. But there's lots of homeomorphisms that are not differentiable anywhere. They're really weird. So it's completely not obvious, but it's a completely basic question. Is it just true that an orientation preserving homeomorphism of R4 can be deformed to the identity? And the answer is yes. So we know the answer. The answer is yes. But I call it a humbling question because the answer uses a vast amount of machinery from, uh, from geometric topology. So it uses the Escobarism theorem. It uses more or less the whole of, of non simply connected surgery theory. It uses the theorem of Chernovsky about local contractibility of homeomorphisms of Rn, it uses the Quinn's thin edge Gavorsen theorem and all sorts of other things. So these are all, you're not meant to know what these are, that's not really important, it doesn't mean to impress you, but it's quite difficult because you need all this stuff, which is not, uh, and almost all of this stuff, maybe apart from Chernovsky's thing, is not actually specifically about homeomorphisms. It's about classification of manifolds, smooth manifolds or, or PL manifolds or something like that. But it all goes in in some very indirect way to proving this incredibly basic fact. And it's the only proof we have of this incredibly basic fact. So there is no proof of this fact that doesn't use, for example, surgery theory, which seems outrageous because it's a question that you can explain to a first year undergraduate. <clears throat> um, so before getting really excited about me explaining to you what this space is or what its topology looks like, we should realize that it took all that effort to work out that it has two path components. So maybe we should lower our expectations a little. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So, uh, so what I want to explain is, is what else is known about this, uh, about the algebraic topology of this space, uh, and then describe a, a, a picture that gives a more or less complete, or conjecturally gives a more or less complete answer uh, from some point of view. Uh, the way I want to convey information to you is using the homotopy groups of this space. So this is one of the standard invariants in algebraic topology. Uh, I don't, luckily in this case, it's quite easy to say what the homotopy groups are without telling you the definition of homotopy groups abstractly. So, so the homotopy groups, they're indexed by a number n. Uh, and what it is for homeomorphisms of Rd is the following. It's the set of homeomorphisms of the n-disc times Rd that are over uh, the n-disc. So they commute with the projection to the n-disc. So in other words, it's an n-parameter family of homeomorphisms of d-dimension of Gibbons. And there's a few little details, like on the boundary of the disk, it should be the identity. And we take them up to deformation, so up to isotopy. But basically, what we were asking before about classifying path components was asking about zero-dimensional families of homeomorphisms, i.e. one homeomorphism. And now we're asking about n-dimensional families of homeomorphisms, and how interesting those can be, or non-interesting. So this is a, how I want to communicate answers to you. Uh, and I want to simplify things. I mean, we have to simplify things. <clears throat> so these are groups. I can compose two homeomorphisms, and that gives me a new homeomorphism. Uh, in fact, they're abelian groups. And so I can tensor them with the rational numbers to get rid of all torsion information in these groups. And that's how I'll communicate information to you. So these are just some rational vector space. So telling you what it is is basically telling you what its dimension is from some point of view. And that's how I try to tell you what progress we've made. Uh, I'm also going to do something weird. You know, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to put a letter B in, and it means shift the index by one. Okay? I could not do that, and then I would have to change all the numbers on all the later slides. So I decided to just make this. So this is just a fiat. If I put a B in, I mean shift the degrees by one. I don't expect you to pay close attention to the degrees of things, and so this will be invisible, but mathematicians feel that they have to be honest in this way, don't they? So I'm trying to be honest. Yeah? Ah, very good. Somebody's paying attention. Yes. Irritatingly, that N should be a D. Yes. <laughs> uh, good. Um, so there's a classical uh, strategy that was developed in the 60s and 70s, which Ulrika uh, alluded to, which is to use uh, homotopy theory, then surgery theory, then so-called pseudo-isotopy theory to understand spaces of symmetries of manifolds in general. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it, 
it has a weakness, which is that even, so it's, it has one weakness, which is that it's very difficult to do, to use this machine, but it has another non-practical, I mean, another sort of theoretical weakness, which is that it can only tell you information up to a certain range of degrees. And that's known to be approximately the dimension of the manifold over three. Okay, and that's just, that's not some failure of effort or something, that's just, that's what it will tell you. Um, and if you apply this method to the disk, and then you do this translation that I mentioned that you can do to say diffeomorphism to the disk is basically the same as homeomorphism of Euclidean space, this is the calculation that you get, as you did Farrell and Xiang in the 70s. Um, so let me tell you, I'm, I'm, there's going to be a few equations like this, so let me tell you how to read it. So this side, these are these rationalized homotopy groups of the space of homeomorphisms, and I've written a star for the index, which means I'm thinking about the sum of all of them together as one object, like a graded vector space. And on this side, this is meant to be a graded vector space. And what this symbol means, it means it's a copy of the rational numbers and it's in grading for i. So this side has a, has a copy of q in degrees 4, 8, 12, and so on. And then it has, a, sometimes it has a copy of q in degree d, and sometimes it has them in d plus 5, d plus 9, d plus 13, and so on. Okay. Uh, and this is the conclusion of this, uh, of this uh, surgery plus pseudoisotopy method. It tells you that this is a, a correct and true calculation of the homotopy groups of homeomorphisms of Rd in degrees up to about four thirds times d, which is what you get if you take this thing and you do the, the translation. Uh, <clears throat> Um, let me just point out that all these cues are not just some abstract one-dimensional vector space. We know we know what these things mean. The, these four eyes, uh, known as Pontryagin classes, and they're somehow a well-known thing in geometric topology. Uh, and these things over here, a bit more surprisingly, have something to do with algebraic K theory of the integers. This is somehow uh, a vast generalization of the classification of H cobordisms due to Waldhausen and his invention of algebraic K-theory of spaces and things like this, they, they, they contribute to this part here. Uh, um, that's not really important, like, th but there's going to be many formulas like this, and I just want to convince you that all the cues in here have names and you can, get to, you can get to know them. So that was somehow the classical method. Uh, and in fact, Ulrika mentioned this briefly already that lately uh, we've got very good at understanding manifolds using a different kind of method, uh, at least understanding very complicated manifolds. So complicated means like in the picture, except you should maybe think of there being like a dot, dot, dot over there. So it means if it's a surface, it means it's a surface of very large genus. And similarly, if it's a higher dimensional manifold, then maybe you should do the analog of connect something with a torus many times to it uh, and the more times you do it, then the happier I will be. And the beginnings of this idea is due to Ulrika. Uh, she showed that, uh, I try to write it just in words without using symbols, but if you look at the diffeomorphism group of a surface and you take its group homology, she proved that that's the homology of another space, uh, which is a very special kind of space called an infinite loop space. And uh, in general, if somebody tells you that some space that is given to you is an infinite loop space, then that's to be considered to be quite a surprising thing because there's much fewer infinite loop spaces than there are general spaces. And she proved that the homology of the diffeomorphism of a surface as the genus goes to infinity is the same as the homology of some infinite loop space. But it, the method did not somehow describe what that infinite loop space was. It proved that it was one but it didn't tell you which one it was in some sense. Uh, but that was resolved a little later by Madsen and Weiss who worked out which infinite loop space you get. It turned out to be one that people had known about all along, but they didn't know it showed up in this context. And that resolved famous conjecture about homology of mapping class groups of surfaces and known as the Mumford conjecture. <clears throat> uh, and then Son Galatius and I showed that the, the analog in some sense, like the literal analog, if you state everything correctly, of those results are true for manifolds of any even dimension. So these were all about two dimensional manifolds. If you think about things the right way, the case of zero dimensional manifolds have been known for a long time. <clears throat> and we showed that the same thing happens for manifolds of any even dimension. Uh, and then those methods were used to study certain odd dimensional manifolds as well, but the, the situation in odd dimensions is not as elegant as it is for even dimensions at the moment. <clears throat> um, but 
this talk was about very simple manifolds like the disk. And something notable about the disk is that it does not have loads of tall y inside it. Right? Uh, it it's, it's not a complicated manifold in the sense of the previous slide. And so what can you possibly hope to gain by knowing about symmetries of very complicated manifolds? So this, there was an idea recently introduced by Michael Weiss, which in some sense is a sort of incidental observation in his paper, which, uh, but has become very influential and has been used to make a lot of progress. And what it says is the following. I mean, the idea sounds naive when I write it in words like this. If you want to have a simple manifold, all you have to do is make it very complicated so that you understand its symmetries and then understand the difference to, between that and what you started with. That's all you have to do. It sounds easy enough. <laughs> uh, but it turns, but there's, a, there's a more concrete implementation of this idea where it is possible to understand the difference using methods completely unrelated to understanding the complicated thing or the simple thing, using this thing called embedding calculus. <clears throat> uh, so I want to tell you two results of mine and my collaborators, uh, Alexander Cooper's and Manuel Kranich, which use this idea and implement it to get some specific calculations. So the first one is to do with uh, even dimensional manifolds. So it's to do with homeomorphisms of an even dimensional Euclidean space. And I'm gonna show you some pictures on the next slides, which will make the statement, like this is obviously impossible to pass, but I'll show you something on the next slide that makes it clear what it means. But what it says is that the formula that Fowell and Xiang proposed in even dimensions is true, not just up to degrees four thirds times the dimension, but it's true with just some exceptions of degrees. So if you pass this, it says it's true up to about three times the dimension, and then there's some exceptions, and then it carries on being true again, and then some more exceptions, and then it carries on being true again. That's what the formula means. It'll be complete, everyone's looking at me like I'm mad, but on the next slide, it will be completely clear what, what this means. <clears throat> um, and the second one is, is the, the odd dimensional version. The statement's a bit different because we proved it a different way, but it says the formula of Fowell and Xiang, if you have a good memory, is the right-hand side, except this last term. Uh, and this theorem says that the formula of Fowell and Xiang is true in more degrees, up to about 2.5 times the dimension, whereas theirs was about 1.3 times the dimension, uh, except it's not quite true because there's another phenomenon showing up. There's some new phenomenon that they didn't see because it's outside the range to which their result applies, but it, but it is there, okay? So like I said, it's much easier to understand in pictures. So this is a picture of the homotopy groups of homeomorphisms of an even dimensional Euclidean space. So every dot is a copy of the rational numbers. So it's a one dimensional vector space. Uh, these horizontal lines are all these classes in degrees four I, these Pontryagin classes that I mentioned. The blue dots are the class in degree D that showed up in the Fowler Siang formula. This, dotted, this black dotted line is the classical range the, the Igusa pseudo-isotopy stable range. So that's the range in which the Fowell and Xiang results were legal. And what we see is that firstly, the pattern they found just continues up way further. And, and it also continues outside of these bands of different colors. And inside the bands, there's some new phenomenon that happens and we don't know what it is. But at least if you exclude those bands of degrees, then this pattern that they discovered just carries on being true. And it's true not just with a limit above, but it's true outside certain thin bands of degrees, okay? That's, the, that's what the first theorem is saying in, in pictures. Uh, and the second one is saying something similar. The theorem is of a, a different flavor. So it, it does just have a cutoff at the top that's about 2.5 times the degree. And what it says is that you look at the pattern that Fowler and Xiang found, which is these horizontal rows of these red dots that are upon dragon classes, these lines of slope one of blue dots, which are these uh, algebraic K-theory related classes. There's some new phenomenon, which is not very visible, but there's a triangle uh, showing up along this line. So that's another one dimensional vector space that has some new meaning that is not from Dragon classes and is not coming from algebraic K-theory. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, yeah, there's some cutoff because we, we couldn't calculate any further. Um, so that's just a picture depicting exactly what I said in the, the second of these results. Um, <clears throat> so, in both cases, let me say this, but while looking at this picture, you could, if somebody presents you with this and they say that underneath these bands are different colors, you're not really supposed to know what's happening. Maybe your most naive kind of Occam's razor kind of guess is that maybe it just looks like the following. Maybe you just have all the red dots everywhere, even in this region where we don't know if they're there. And maybe we just have some phenomenon happening periodically along this line 
of slope. I think it's three. Analogous to this blue things that we have happening along here, which is sort of periodic. Or maybe we have another periodic thing happening along this line of slope four and another periodic thing happening on the line of slope five. And the simplest possible behavior would be that this phenomena just don't interact. You just get the sum of all these terms and there's no interaction between them. That would be the simplest possible formula. Um, and uh, that is um, what I want to propose happens. So there's a conjecture that I sort of want to explain, which is that probably the, uh, the full answer is as follows. You take what Fowell and Xiang found and you superimpose on top of it a countable collection of new phenomena happening on different wavelengths, if you like, or different slopes in this picture. 2D, 3D, 4D, and so on. And, and the conjecture is not just that that's what should happen, that it's the sum of, it's the sum of one phenomena for each slope, but we know, we know what the phenomena are. And the, the, or at least this is conjecturally we know. <clears throat> uh, the phenomenon at wavelength L times D should be this thing called commutative graph cohomology, the L loop version of commutative graph cohomology. Um, so uh, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about what that is, but let me just write down the proposal. So the proposal is that the homotopy groups of homeomorphisms of d dimensional Euclidean space rationally is just given by this. It's all the Pontryagin classes that we knew, all the stuff coming from algebraic K theory that we knew, and then the sum from L being two and upwards of the homology of the L loop graph complex, okay? And it's just the sum of these things. There's no interaction between the pieces is, is the, meant to be the, the interesting point of what I'm saying here. <clears throat> um, so to, to make this real, I had better explain to you what this, uh, what this L loop graph homology is. Um, <clears throat> so it's a relatively simple idea which is that we're just going to make a chain complex where the basis is just connected graphs with L loops. So I think you will know what I mean by a loop if when you count how many this has, you also get five. I think that's what I get. Uh, so loop means, I mean, the formal way to say it is you count how big the first homology of this, uh, of this space is. <clears throat> um, and there's a few rules about graphs, like maybe you know there's no such thing as a as a vertex with two edges entering, so valence has to be at least three. Um, and uh, but maybe that's all actually. Maybe that's the only rule. So that's true here. And every such graph has a number attached to it, which is what degree it's going to contribute to in this graded vector space. And the degree is calculated by this formula: it's d plus d minus one times the number of edges minus d times the number of vertices. Do not ask why, that is what it is. <clears throat> and what we want to do is we want to say that there's a, that, that this is, so this for now is a graded vector space. The basis is graphs. There's finitely many of any given number loop order if you put this bound on vertices. So it's a finite dimensional vector space. They're in different degrees, so it's a graded vector space. And I want to say that it's a chain complex, meaning that there's a differential on it that squares to zero. And the differential is roughly speaking, given by the easiest thing in the world, the boundary or D of a graph is you take the sum of all the graphs you get by collapsing one edge. Uh, as long as you don't do illegal things, like for example, you shouldn't collapse an edge that was a loop because then it doesn't have L loops anymore. But there's a few little rules like that that you shouldn't do, but you sum over all sort of reasonable ways of collapsing an edge and you put in some signs. And to be a differential, for this to be a chain complex, there's one equation that has to be true, which is that delta squared is zero. That's the defining formula of what a chain complex is. And what you discover is that whether or not that's true will depend sensitively on how you decide to put signs in here. And there's two ways you can do it that will make it true. There's two basic conventions you can take for how to put these signs on that will both make d squared be zero. Uh, I'm not going to tell you either of them. I'm just going to say there's, there's two ways to do it. Uh, and both ways don't strictly work in the way I've described it here. You have to uh, put on your graphs a little bit more data. Uh, so let me just tell you what one of the ways is. One of the ways is you should say the vertices should come with an order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The, the um, what else? The 
half edges coming into a vertex should come with an order. And the edges should come with an arrow on them saying which way they go. Modulo, you're allowed to change the direction of the arrow and then you get minus the graph. You're allowed to reorder the vertices and then you get the sign of that permutation times the graph. And you're allowed to reorder the half edges and then you get the sign of the permutation times the graph. <clears throat> so the, num the, the dimension of that space is exactly the dimension of what I said, because every graph, I mean, you're allowed to change all, these, all this data that I said by any permutation you like. So that in some sense, there's no more data, but that sort of is because there's a sign rule for when you change things. It's a little bit complicated, but there's two basic ways to do it. Uh, and uh, and uh, the way I've said it here, if you put a D in, then the sign of D tells you which way you should choose. The parity of D, sorry, not the sign. <clears throat> so there's, there's some rule that involves summing with some signs, all way, ways of contracting an edge. And it satisfies D squared is zero. And then graph homology means the homology of this complex, as always. So if you have an operator that squares to zero, you can take the kernel of it, and that will contain the image of itself. And then you take the quotient. That's what homology means. So this is a completely combinatorial thing. If you fix a number L, there's finitely many graphs with L loops. You write down your finite dimensional vector space. You write down one operator delta on it, which involves some signs. And then you take its kernel modulo its image, and you get some finite dimensional graded vector space. Uh, and that's what this graph model is. And this is what they turn out to be, the first view. So <clears throat> it depends on the parity of D, as I said. How, like how the formula for the differential you should choose depends on the parity of D. For some reason that I have no idea why this should be true, the one for D even tends to be smaller than the one for D odd, but that apparently is what happens. <laughs> Uh, and you should read this just like the formulas I said before. In each loop order, say loop order three, or let's take a more exciting one, maybe loop order six, this is a graded vector space that is two copies of Q in grading 60 minus 15, and is one copy of Q in grading 60 minus 20. Okay? So the formula is somehow the same as, uh, or the sort of formalism is the same as I was using before. <clears throat> so this is obviously something you can do by computer, right? You enumerate graphs, you write down your big matrix for partial, and then you compute its kernel and its image. Um, but there are a lot of graphs. So the furthest that we can currently get by, not we, Wilwacher basically, and his collaborators, the furthest one can get by computer is up to loop order 10. And it sort of approximately doubles in difficulty to go one loop order higher. So basically we'll probably never do loop order 11. Um, but this is what you get the first view. So the, 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 a bigger table is known, but only a finite table of these is actually known. Uh, but that's the conjecture. The conjecture is that this explains, this completely explains the difference between Fowl and Xiang's proposed answer, which was true in the range that they proposed it, and, and the truth. And if you take all the things that are known and superimpose it on my chart, then this is conjecturally at least a true <coughs> description uh, of the homotopy groups of homomorphisms of an even dimensional Euclidean space. So, and you sort of see that it's got these periodicities or families of different kind of uh, slopes. So the Pontryagin classes sort of have slope zero, or the class has slope two, sorry, slope one. <clears throat> there is actually meant to be a line of slope two, except that it happens to just be the zero dimensional vector space. So you don't see it, but in principle it's there. And then there's one phenomenon of slope three, and these lines, it's a bit difficult to see in this graph, but their, their slopes are getting bigger and bigger as you go up. So this, I think, is not quite correct. I think to know what goes there, you would need to know the loop order 11 uh, calculation as well. But it's, apart from this very top bit of the first column, this is, this is uh, basically correct. <clears throat> uh, so I think this is, um, <clears throat> so we don't know this yet. This is a conjecture for what should happen. What we know is that there's some gaps, and we know that we sort of know there is meant to be some connection to this graph uh, homology. Uh, I'd be quite confident that this is true, uh, but it's it's kind of fascinating because it does not seem when you start thinking about symmetries of Euclidean space, continuous symmetries of Euclidean space, that you should be inventing some algebraic object to do with the combinatorics of finite graphs and loops and contracting edges one at a time and things like that. I mean, these things are not very obviously related. It's also not very obviously related to algebraic K-theory, although that was known earlier by this work of Fowl and Xiang, that in fact that does contribute. Uh, but it's kind of extraordinary. I mean, also these Pondragon classes, if you put 
you look at them the right way, these horizontal rows come from another algebraic object known as L theory, a sort of cousin to K theory. Uh, and it's kind of incredible that these all come together in some way to describe, in some sense, something that you can explain to an undergraduate, which is what is the shape of the space of homeomorphisms of R6, for example. Um, so anyway, this is this kind of chart and the hope that it might be actually correct is more or less the state of the art in this business at the moment. And uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, that was great. Um, questions? Okay, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Dramatic sense. Um, the, my, my question is about um, applications um, of this phenomena, but um, I, so, so I can help but think that deformations of space um, will inevitably arise in various areas of pure and applied mathematics. Um, so these um, topological obstructions are possibly going to tell like people, oh, you can't do that sort of thing. Um, when, whenever there's a crazy deformation that happens in completely unrelated number theoretic thing or um, even numerical analysis setting, there might be a deformation as such and um, people might want to try to, as if it's an engineer trying to solve a quintic equation, um, try to deform something and then there's a crazy obstruction. And I wonder if there's a well-studied field of such uh, applications. Um. <clears throat> I mean, my, what a, one reason I'm interested, I think, in symmetry groups of manifolds in general is that if, if you're interested in any kind of geometric structure on a manifold, like metrics or symplectic forms or anything that you like, if it doesn't use coordinates to define it, then the group of symmetries of that manifold acts on the space of all such things. So you can try to probe the topology of the space of all metrics. That's not so interesting, but let's say all positive Ricci curvature metrics or all symplectic forms or something, you can try to probe it by picking one and acting on it with the group with all diffeomorph all symmetries of the manifold. Uh, so that's a kind of application, I think, of these kind of things in the guise uh, under, you have to do the translation so that it's about diffeomorphisms of a disk instead of homeomorphisms of Euclidean space. I think from the point of view of more uh, practical, uh, let's say non-pure mathematical applications, I don't think anybody, in some sense, in the real world, how can you possibly tell if something is or is not differentiable? Or if it's a homeomorphism versus a diffeomorphism or something? You sort of can't, right? Um, I mean, because you have to do, I mean, you have to do infinitely many experiments and you can't. So it, it's a little, I mean, physics is founded on the idea that everything is smooth, why not? <clears throat> But uh, I mean, how could you possibly tell? Uh, and I don't know if there's, um, uh, I mean, I think people already try to use exotic behavior in different topology, like the existence of exotic spheres and so on, and therefore other smooth structures on manifolds and so on, and thinking about what the physical implications are. But in some sense, maybe reality is not even smooth. It's something even coarser, like just topological or just you might think it's on some sort of grid, so maybe it's sort of piecewise linear or something like that. Uh, and from that point of view, all the things that we're doing with smooth topology are just some sort of approximations, which are true. And this is a way in which topological topology is very different to smooth topology. Symmetries of Euclidean space, which is one, maybe one of the more basic things you could ask, it does utterly different. Um, and I don't, have a, I don't have a somehow, you know, thing you can point at and say, this is a concrete consequence that it should have. But I think it's, you know, maybe at least at, at a philosophical level, one could start thinking along those lines. Any other questions? Yeah, you too. Do any of these constructions give us, any of these theories give a sense of how you might go about constructing exotic 
homeomorphism. Right. Uh, no. Because, uh, bec but it's, it's sort of, it's easy to say why. Um, every time I wrote a bullet saying this is a one-dimensional vector space, what's really true is that we have, a, we have a, an invariant. We have a map out of it to Q. And those you can construct. Those are, if you rephrase it in terms of smooth symmetries of the disk, then they're so-called configuration space integrals, which is a very concrete thing that you can do in Durham per Moldy. You take your family of diffeomorphisms, you act on configurations of numbers of points in all possible ways, and you integrate over that configuration space, and you glue them together in some way as given by the graph complex, and you get a number. But it's one thing to like have an invariant and me to like a map to the rational numbers and me to promise to you that it's subjective. But that doesn't tell you how to find something that goes to a non-zero number. So we're sort of in the first situation. We, I can, we can produce the maps and they're somehow given in a concrete way and we can produce the promise that they are subjective. But that doesn't tell you how to make little families of things that will see them. This work that I mentioned very briefly of uh, Watanabe, um, uh, does give concrete constructions of, of diffeomorphisms uh, of the disk uh, that are detected by these configuration space integrals. And from the point of view of my pictures, they correspond to um, the uh, top of the graph complex. So the, the worst you can be if you're one of my graphs is you can be trivalent at every vertex. Then you can never be the boundary of something because whenever you collapse an edge, you make at least four vertices. So the very top is trivalent graphs. And uh, the cycles there, we know, we know elements that represent them. And there's a, there's a, con there's a concrete construction of families of diffeomorphisms. But I think that's all we know for now. <laughs> okay, D just a very quick question. How far are we away proving this conjecture now? Or is this uh, so uh, difficult that it you know, will take another 30 years, 40 years? No. I'm the, so I, I drew the chart for ev in, in the even dimensional situation. We're not super far away. I think there's a there's a strategy, and it's I mean there's things to do, and so I'm working on that with Thomas Woolwacher and uh, Alexander Coopers. Um, in odd dimensions, I mean if it's true in the even dimensional situation, it's sort of implausible because the formula is so clean. It's not going to be true half the time and not true the other half. But it might take longer to prove that because there's foundational things that we have to do about diffeomorphisms or dimensional manifolds that we don't know how to do yet. So, in other words, there's a program. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for bringing us the data. Thank you. I do need to say we adjourn the meeting and there's tea outside, and we'll come back here at uh, five to five. Thank you. <laughs>